Chapter One of Bindle by Herbert Jenkins. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bindle Chapter One The Bindles at Home. Women, remarked Bindle as he gazed reflectively into the tankard he had just drained. Women is all right if you can keep em from marrying yer. I don't old with women, growled Ginger, casting a malevolent glance at the Blue Boar's only barmaid, as she stood smirking at the other end of the long leaden counter. Same as before, he added to the barman. Joseph Bindle heaved a sign of contentment at the success of his rueful contemplation of the emptiness of his tankard. You're too late, old sport, he remarked, as he sympathetically surveyed the unprepossessing features of his companion, where freckles rioted with spots and happy abandon. You're too late, you with three babies, four year twenty-five. Ginger, you're... No, I ain't. There was a note of savage menace in Ginger's voice that caused his companion to look at him curiously. Ain't what? questioned Bindle. I ain't what you was going to say I was. How'd you know what I was going to say? Cause every stutterin' fool says it, and blimey I'm going to ammer the next, and I don't want to ammer you, Joe. Bindle pondered a moment, then a smile irradiated his features, developing into a broad grin. You're too touchy, Ginger. I wasn't going to say, Ginger, you're barmy. Ginger winced and clenched his fists. I was going to say, Ginger, you're no good at marriage without tack. If you had more tact, maybe you wouldn't have got married. Ginger spat viciously in the direction of the spittoon, but his feelings were too strong for accurate aim. The parsons say as marriages is made in heaven, growled Ginger. Why don't heaven feed the kids? That's what I want to know. Ginger was notorious among his mates for the gloomy view he took of life. No one had ever discovered in him enthusiasm for anything. If he went to a football match and the team he favored were beaten, it was no more than he expected. If they were victorious, his comment would be that they ought to have scored more goals. If the horse he backed won, he blamed fate because his stake was so small. The more beer he absorbed, the more misanthropic he seemed to become. "'Funny coves, Parsons,' remarked Bindle conversationally. "'Not as I've anything to say agin religion, providing it's kept for Sundays and Good Fridays.' and don't get mixed up with the rest of the week he paused and lifted the newly filled tankard to his lips presently he continued reminiscently my father had religion and drunk hisself to death keepin the chill out according to him if yer wanted to be appy in the next world you ad to be a sort of aft fish in this he could tell the tale he could and what's more he used to make us believe him bindle laughed at the recollection Two or three times a week he used to go to chapel to wash his sins away, winter and summer. The parson seemed to have to wash the old bloomin' lot of em, and my father never forgot to take something on his way home to keep the chill out. He was that careful of hisself. My life is God's, he used to say, and I must take care of what is the Lord's. There weren't no spots on my father. Why, he used to wet his air to prove he'd been mersed, as he called it. You'd have liked him, Ginger. He was a gloomy sort of cove, same as you. Ginger muttered something inarticulate and buried his freckles and spots in his tankard. Bindle carefully filled his short clay pipe and lit it with a care and precision more appropriate to a cigar. No, he continued, I ain't nothing agin religion. It's the people what goes in for it as does me. There's my brother-in-law, Arty by name, and my missus. They must make Evan tired with their moaning. What'd your marry her for? grumbled Ginger thickly, not with any show of interest, but as if to demonstrate that he was still awake. Ginger! There was reproach in Bindle's voice. Fancy you arstin' a silly question like that. Don't yer know as no man ever marries any woman? If he's nippy, he gets orf the ook. If he ain't, he's landed. You and me wasn't nippy enough, old son, and here we are. There's something in that, mate. There was feeling in Ginger's voice and a momentary alertness in his eye. Well, continued Bindle, once on the hook, there's only one thing that'll save yer. Tack. Or Ameron or Blue, interpolated Ginger viciously. I draws the line there. I don't old with Ameron women. 
"'Yer can't ammer something what can't ammer back, Ginger. "'That's for furriners. "'No, tax the thing. "'Now take my missus. "'If your back answers her when she ain't feelin' chatty, "'you're as good as done. "'What I does is to keep quiet and seem sorry. "'Then she dries up. Arter a bit, I'll whistle or um gospel bells. "'That's her favourite im, Ginger. "'As if to myself. Then out I goes, and when I gets home to supper, I takes in a tin of salmon, and it's all over till the next time. With tack, gospel bells, and a tin of salmon, yer can do a rare lot with women, Ginger. What yer do if yer couldn't whistle or um, and if salmon made your old woman sick, same as it does mine? What yer do then? Ginger thrust his head forward aggressively. Bindle thought deeply for some moments, then with slow deliberation said, Oh, i think ginger i'd kill a slop they always anger for killin slops there was a momentary silence as both men drained their pewters and a moment after they left the blue boar they walked along each deep in his own thoughts in the direction of hammersmith church where they parted bindle to proceed to fulham and ginger to chiswick each to the mate that had been thrust upon him by an undiscriminating fate joseph bindle was a little man bald-headed with a red nose but he was possessed of a great heart which no misfortune ever daunted two things in life he loved above all others beer and humour or as he called it his little joke yet he permitted neither to interfere with the day's work save under very exceptional circumstances no one had ever seen him drunk he had once explained to a mate who urged upon him an extra glass i don't put more on me back than i can carry and i do ditto with me stomach bindle was a journeyman furniture remover by profession and the life of a journeyman furniture remover is fraught with many vicissitudes and hardships as one of the profession once phrased it to bindle if it wasn't for them bespattered quarter days there might be a livin in it people however move at set periods or as bindle put it they seems to take root as if they was bloomin vegetables the set periods are practically reduced to three for few care to face the inconvenience of a christmas move once upon a time family removals were leisurely affairs which the contractors took care to spread over many days now however moving is a matter of contract or as bindle himself expressed it you're asked to carry a bookcase under one arm a spring mattress under the other a pianer on your back and then they wonders why you ain't doing something with your teeth all these things conspired to make bindle's living a precarious one he was not lazy and sought work assiduously in his time he had undertaken many strange jobs his intelligence and ready wit giving him an advantage over his competitors but if his wit gained for him employment his unconquerable desire to indulge in his little jokes almost as frequently lost it for him as the jobs became less frequent mrs bindle waxed more eloquent to her a man who was not working was a brute or a lazy hound she made no distinction between the willing and the unwilling and she heaped the fire of her burning reproaches upon the head of her luckless man whenever he was unable to furnish her with a full week's housekeeping bindle was not lazy enough to be unpopular with his superiors or sufficiently energetic to merit the contempt of his fellow workers he did his job in average time and strove to preserve the middle course that should mean employment and pleasant associates lost your job was a frequent interrogation on the lips of mrs bindle at first bindle had striven to parry this inevitable question with a pleasantry but he soon discovered that his wife was impervious to his most brilliant efforts and he learned in time to shroud his degradation in an impenetrable veil of silence only in the hour of prosperity would he preserve his verbal cheerfulness she thinks too much of soap in her soul to make an owlin success a marriage he had once confided to a mate over a pint of beer a little dirt and a less religion might keep her out of heaven in the next world but it'd keep me out of hell in this mrs bindle was obsessed with two ogres dirt and the devil her cleanliness was the cleanliness that rendered domestic comfort impossible just as her godliness was the godliness of suffering in this world and glory in the next her faith was the faith of negation the happiness to be enjoyed in the next world would be in direct ratio to the sacrifices made in this denying herself the things that her 
carnal nature cried out for she was filled with an intense resentment that anyone else should continue to live in obvious enjoyment of what she had resolutely put from her her only consolation was the triumph she was to enjoy in the next world and she found no little comfort in the story of divas and lazarus the forgiveness of sins was a matter upon which she preserved an open mind her faith told her that they should be forgiven but she felt something of the injustice of it all that the sinner who at the eleventh hour repenteth should achieve paradise in addition to having drunk deep of the cup of pleasure in this world seemed to her unfair to the faithful to mrs bindle the world was a miserable place but please god it should be a clean place as far as she had the power to make it clean when a woman sets out to be a reformer she invariably begins upon her own menfolk mrs bindle had striven long and lugubriously to ensure bindle's salvation and when she had eventually discovered this to be impossible she accepted him as her cross whilst struggling for bindle's salvation mrs bindle had not overlooked the more immediate needs of his body for many weeks of their early married life a tin bath of hot water had been placed regularly in the kitchen each friday night that bindle might be thorough in his ablutions at first mrs bindle had been surprised and gratified at the way in which bindle had acquiesced in this weekly rite but being shrewd and something of a student of character particularly bindle's character her suspicions had been aroused one friday evening she put the kitchen keyhole to an illicit use and discovered bindle industriously rubbing his hands on his boots and with much use of soap washing them in the bath after which he splashed the water about the room dampened the towels then lit his pipe and proceeded to read the evening paper that was the end of the bath episode it was not that bindle objected to washing as a matter of fact he was far more cleanly than most of his class but to him mrs bindle's methods savoured too much of coercion a great frenchman has said pour faire quelque chose de grand il faut être passion in other words no wanton sprite or mischief or humour must be permitted to beckon genius from its predestined path although an entire stranger to philosophy ignorant alike of the word and its meaning mrs bindle had arrived at the same conclusion as the french savant why don't you stick at something as if you meant it was her way of phrasing it look at mr hearty see what he's done without any thought of irreverence mrs bindle used the names of the lord and mr hearty as whips of scorpions with which on occasion she mercilessly scourged her husband at the time of bindle's encounter with his one-time workmate ginger he had been tramping for hours seeking a job he had gone even to the length of answering an advertisement for a waitress explaining to the irritated advertiser that with women it was the customers as did the waitin and that a man was more nippy than a gal ginger's hospitality had cheered him and he began to regard life once more with his accustomed optimism he had been without food all day and this fact rather than the continued rebuffs he had suffered caused him some misgiving as the hour approached for his return to home and mrs bindle's inevitable question got a job as he passed along the fulham palace road his keen eye searched everywhere for interest and amusement he winked jocosely at the pretty girls and grinned happily when called a saucy hound he exchanged pleasantries with any one who showed the least inclination towards camaraderie and the door he silenced with caustic rejoinder bindle's views upon the home life of england were not unorthodox i'd like to meet the cove what first started talking about the appy home life of old england he murmured under his breath i'd like to introduce him to mrs b might sort o wake him up a bit and make him want to immigrate i'd like to see him gettin away without a scrap rummy thing home life his philosophy was to enjoy what you've got and not to bother about what you hope to get he had once precipitated a domestic storm by saying to mrs bindle don't you put all your money on the next world in case of accidents angels is funny things and they might sort of take a dislike to yer and then the fat'd be in the fire then critically surveying mrs bindle's manifest leanness not as you and me together i'd make much of a flicker in l as he approached fenton street where he lived his leisurely pace perceptibly slackened it was true that supper awaited him at the end of his journey that was with luck but luck or no luck mrs bindle was inevitable funny how avin a wife seems to spoil your appetite he muttered 
as he scratched his head through the blue and white cricket cap he invariably wore where the four triangles of alternating white and cambridge blue had lost much of their original delicacy of shade i'm hungry hungry as an auk he continued then after a pause he added i wonder whether auks marry the idea seemed to amuse him well well he remarked with a sigh you are got to face it joe and pulling himself together he mended his pace as he had foreseen mrs bindle was keenly on the alert for the sound of his key in the lock of the outer door of their half-house he had scarcely realized that the evening meal was to consist of something stewed with his much-loved onions when mrs bindle's voice was heard from the kitchen with the time-worn question got a job hunger and the smell of his favourite vegetable made him a coward how jer know fairy he asked with crude facetiousness what is it inquired mrs bindle shrewdly as he entered the kitchen night watchman at a garage he lied glibly and removed his coat preparatory to what he called a rinse at the sink it always pleased mrs bindle to see bindle wash even such a perfunctory effort as a rinse was a tribute to her efforts when do you start she asked suspiciously how persistent women were thought bindle to-night at nine he replied nothing mattered with that savoury smell in his nostrils mrs bindle was pacified but her emotions were confidential affairs between herself and the lord and she consequently preserved the same unrelenting exterior about time i should think she snapped ungraciously and proceeded with her culinary preparations mrs bindle was an excellent cook if her temper was like her cookin bindle had confided to mrs hearty life would be a little bit of heaven fenton street in which the bindles lived was an offering to the moloch of british exclusiveness the houses consisted of two floors and each floor had a separate outer door and a narrow passage from which opened off a parlour a bedroom and a kitchen although each household was cut off from the sight of its immediate neighbours there was not a resident save those who occupied the end houses who was not immediately acquainted with the private affairs of at least three of its neighbours those above or below as the case may be and of the family on each side the walls and floors were so thin that when the least emotion set the voices of the occupants vibrating in a louder key than usual the neighbours knew of the crisis as soon as the protagonists themselves and every aspect of the dispute or discussion was soon the common property of the whole street fenton street suited mrs bindle who was intensely exclusive she never joined the groups of women who stood each morning and many afternoons at their front doors to discuss the thousand and one things that women have to discuss she occupied herself with her home hounding from its hiding place each speck of dust and microbe as if it were an embodiment of the devil himself she was a woman of narrow outlook and prejudiced views hating sin from a sense of fear of what it might entail rather than as a result of instinctive repulsion yet she was possessed of many admirable qualities she worked long and hard in her home did her duty to her husband in mending his clothes preparing his food and providing him with what she termed a comfortable home next to chapel her supreme joy in life was her parlour a mid-victorian riot of antimacassars stools furniture photograph frames pictures ornaments and the musical box that would not play but was precious as aunt anne's legacy bindle was wont to say that when yer goes into her parlour yer wants a map and a guide and even then yer as to call for help before yer can get out mrs bindle had no visitors and consequently her domestic holy of holies was never used she would dust and clean and arrange arrange clean and dust with untiring zeal the windows although never opened were spotless for she judged a woman's whole character by the appearance of her windows and curtains no religieuse ever devoted more time or thought to a chapel or an altar than mrs bindle to her parlour she might have reconciled herself to having anything else in the world but her parlour would have held her a helpless prisoner when everything was ready for the meal mrs bindle poured from a saucepan a red-brown liquid with cubes of darker brown which splashed joyously into the dish bindle recognized it as stewed steak and onions the culinary joy of his heart with great appetite he fell to almost thankful to providence for sending him so excellent a cook as he ate he argued that if a man had an angel for a wife in all likelihood she would not be able to cook and perhaps after all he was not so badly off 
remarked Bindle, indicating the dish with his fork. And a momentary flicker that might have been a smile stillborn passed across Mrs. Bindle's face. As the meal progressed, Bindle began to see the folly of his cowardice. He had doomed himself to a night's walking the streets. He cudgelled his brains how to avoid the consequences of his indiscretion. He looked covertly at Mrs. Bindle. There was nothing in the sharp hatchet-like face with its sandy hair drawn tightly away from each side and screwed into a knot behind that suggested compromise. Nor was there any suggestion of a relenting nature in that hard grey line that served as her mouth. No, there was nothing for it but to carry the banner, unless he could raise sufficient money to pay for a night's lodging. "'Saw Ginger tonight," he remarked conversationally as he removed a shred of meat from a back tooth with his fork. "'Don't talk to me of Ginger,' snapped Mrs. Bindle. Such retorts made conversation difficult. It was Mrs. Bindle's question as to whether he did not think it about time he started that gave Bindle the inspiration he sought. For more than a week the one clock of the household, a dainty little travelling affair that he had purchased of a fellow workman, it having sort of got lost in a move, had stopped and showed itself impervious to all persuasion. Bindle decided to take it, ostensibly to a clock repairer, but in reality to the pawn-shop, and thus raise the price of a night's lodging. He would trust to luck to supply the funds to retrieve it. With a word of explanation to Mrs. Bindle, he proceeded to wrap up the clock in a piece of newspaper and prepared to go out. To Bindle, the moment of departure was always fraught with the greatest danger. His goings out became strategic withdrawals, he endeavouring to get off unnoticed, Mrs. Bindle striving to rake him with her verbal artillery as he retreated. On this particular evening he felt comparatively safe. He was, as far as Mrs. Bindle knew, going to a job, and what was more, he was taking the clock to be repaired. He sidled tactically along the wall towards the door, as if keenly interested in getting his pipe to draw. Mrs. Bindle opened fire. "'How long's your job for?' she turned round in the act of wiping out a saucepan. "'Only to-night,' replied Bindle somewhat lamely. He was afraid of where further romancing might lead him. "'Call that a job?' she inquired scornfully. "'How long am I to go on keeping you in idleness?' Mrs. Bindle cleaned the Alton Road Chapel, where she likewise worshipped, and to this she referred. "'I'll get another job to-morrow. Don't be downhearted,' Bindle replied cheerfully. "'Downhearted? You ought to be ashamed of yourself!' exploded Mrs. Bindle, as she banged the saucepan upon its shelf and seized the broom. Bindle regarded her with expressionless face. "'You ought to be ashamed of yourself, your great hokin brute!' At one time, Bindle, who was well below medium height and average weight, had grinned appreciatively at this description, but it had a little lost its savour by repetition. "'Call yourself a man,' she continued, her sharp voice rising in volume and key, "'leaving me to keep the sticks together, me, a woman, too, a-keeping you in idleness? Why, I'd steal, for I'd do that, that I would!' She made vigorous use of the broom. Her anger invariably manifested itself in dust, a momentary forgetfulness of her religious convictions, and a lapse into the Doric. As a rule, she was careful and mincing in her speech, but anger opened the floodgates of her vocabulary, and words rushed forth bruised and decapitated. With philosophic self-effacement, Bindle covered the few feet between him and the door, and vanished. He was a philosopher, and, like Socrates, he bowed to the whirlwind of his wife's wrath. Conscious of having done everything humanly possible to obtain work, he faced the world with unruffled calm. Mrs. Bindle's careless words, however, sank deeply into his mind. Steel! Well, he had no very strongly grounded objection, provided he were not caught at it. Steel! The word seemed to open up new possibilities for him. The thing was, how should he begin? He might seize a leg of mutton from a butcher's shop and run, but then nature had not intended him for a runner. He might smash a jeweler's window, pick a pocket, or snatch a handbag, but in all these adventures fleetness of foot seemed essential. Crime seemed obviously for the sprinter. To become a burglar required experience and tools, and Bindle possessed neither. Besides, burgling involved more risks than he cared to take. Had he paused to think, Bindle would have seen that stealing was crime, but his incurable love of adventure blinded him to all else. "'Funny thing,' he mumbled as he walked down Fenton Street. 
Funny thing, a daughter of the Lord wantin' me to steal. Wonder what old Artie'd say. End of chapter one. Read by Don W. Jenkins. Rancho San Diego, California. Shaggybark.blogspot.com